You are watching the webinar on the interdisciplinarity of national security. We have some reminders with regards to the webinar etiquette. Number one, always be on time. Number two, dress appropriately. A webinar is a formal engagement in an online setting. Number three, check your Wi-Fi connection before joining the webinar or online training. Number four, use appropriate equipment for the webinar. When using a mobile phone, use a headset to reduce the noise that they pick up in your location. Avoid using the speakerphone. Number five, put your phone on silent or airplane mode and avoid taking a call while the webinar is ongoing. Number six, use the mute button to prevent a necessary noise that will disrupt the program. Release the unmute button when it's time for you to speak or during the question and answer forum. Number seven, when asking a question, state your name and your affiliation first before throwing in your questions. Also, speak with clarity. Number eight, be courteous and do not engage in a chat with others while the webinar is ongoing. And lastly, number nine, the organizers reserve the right to disengage anyone from the webinar who will not follow the guidelines. We hope you will find this session insightful. As much as civic subjects tell us that the Constitution exists to outline the framework and functions of government, the protection of the various liberties of the people, and the pursuit of peace, there's a tendency to overlook how these deal with the creations and concepts that are culturally, economically, and geographically informed. For this, we turn to the importance of understanding national security. National security is a state or condition wherein the people's way of life and institutions, their territorial integrity and sovereignty, their welfare and well-being are protected and enhanced. We'll be listening to Dr. Chesser Cabalza as we cover the interdisciplinary nature that shapes national security for the appreciation of the regular citizen. I'm Dominique Gentado, and this is Interdisciplinarity of National Security. Now, to condition our frame of thinking, we'll be hearing from Mr. Raman R. Sarmiento, Jr., II, Department Chair of Interdisciplinary Studies. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, KIDS, and welcome to Far Eastern University um, Interdisciplinary Studies Department. Uh, national security is not just a right, but it's also a duty of every citizen. It is considered as a collective right that needs to have a collective action. It is also interdisciplinary since it encompasses interrelated perspectives. Um, given this, let me give you a glimpse on how national security encompasses the different areas of social science discipline. In our history, national security is equivalent to our independence and freedom from any colonial power. In psychology, National security is a need, as shown on the second Maslow's hierarchy of needs, safety and security. In economics, national security is the way of securing the supply to meet the demand of our society. In political science, national security is the requirement to maintain the survival of the state through the use of power and diplomacy. And in geography, national security is demarcating our territorial, maritime and exclusive economic zone. With these interrelated branches, let us continue to explore the interdisciplinarity of national security. Once again, good morning and welcome to FEU IAS IDS webinar. Thank you very much, Mr. Sarmiento. So our speaker for the session is Dr. Chester Cabalza. He is founder and president of the Manila-based think tank, International Development and Security Cooperation. And he teaches in the graduate school at the University of the Philippines, Diliman. Considered as the father of security anthropology in Southeast Asia, he also lectures for and advises theses 
of Senior Military Officers at the National Defense College of the Philippines and the Command and General Staff College. A fellow of the College of Defense Studies at the National Defense University in Beijing and the US State Department under the stewardship of the University of Delaware. He has published in peer review journals in the purview of security studies and recently co-authored Perspective on Terrorism in the Philippine Context and won the IFSSO International Prize for the Social Science Award. He's regularly interviewed by local and foreign media on the South China Sea, regional terrorism, and related international political economy issues. Let's all welcome Dr. Chester Cabalsa. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Dominica Juntado. Uh, thank you for inviting me. And of course, to your chair, uh, Professor Roman Sarmiento Jr., thank you for inviting me here. Um, I'm really happy uh, to be part of your program. And of course, uh, later on, we will hear from uh, Professor Oliver uh, Fabricante, the reactor for my uh, discussion uh, this morning. Okay, uh, I was uh, tasked to discuss about the interdisciplinarity of um, national security. And uh, this is uh, interesting given that, of course, um, one of the um, um, features of uh, national security is the interdisciplinarity of its um, um, uh, of the discourse. And uh, basically, we will try to understand why many uh, disciplines are needed to fully understand uh, the context of national security. And uh, we will uh, be uh, expounding on that as we go on with our discussion. Okay, um, of course, uh, as mentioned earlier uh, by uh, Dr. Um, Juntado and Professor um, Sarmiento, uh, basically, when we talk about security, it's the um, um, freedom from uh, threat basically, and uh, what do we want, basically. It's a state of mind. At the same time, it's a feeling. So we'll see later on how these um, security issues will uh, affect our society and the individuals itself. Okay, uh, let, uh, let's try to look at the uh, archaeology of security here. Uh, basically, where does security come from? And how did it evolve, basically? You know, um, since um, the beginning of time, uh, as we look at the uh, science of it, no? the invention of politics and the rise of civilizations, people are talking about prehistorical context of security. Our ancestors, uh, when they became bipedal, and of course, with the enlargement of their um, uh, brains, they kind of um, went out from the caves and uh, started to... Uh, uh, to look for security because of the insecurities from food, uh, shelter, and basically from protection. Because of course you have mammoth there and some other external factors trying to threaten humanity basically. And then all of a sudden from bands and then tribes, you know, wars, you, uh, uh, tribal wars basically is in the, uh, are individual. And uh, because there was competition for uh, supplies and food basically. And then with the formation of uh, communities, we've seen family feud and basically civil wars. So nonetheless, war from a realist perspective in international relations, we would see that it's really um, true and it's um, a reality and it threatens humanity basically. But all of a sudden we've seen how um, our um, ancestors evolved basically from bands, tribes, and then communities, and then all of a sudden you have civilizations that later on would create cities and city-states and nation-states, basically. And then uh, in Latin word, of course, we're trying to, to search what's the meaning of security, basically. And uh, from the Latin word, it's, it says that it's uh, securus. Se means uh, without and uh, freedom from anxiety, and cura means care. So it's only in the 16th century when we saw the concept of uh, security in the English language. And it says their freedom from want, resilience against potential harm, presence of material things, containment, and as a state of mind. So basically it's very cerebral. It's a, it's a framework on how we basically uh, get rid of these uh, insecurities. And by 17th century, we've seen that uh, uh, humanity uh, have experienced uh, uh, these uh, wars, basically, the 30 years of war in uh, Europe and the Civil War in England, and of course, basically, the 18th century Concert of Europe, where we've seen a competition of hegemony 
as uh, we've seen a lot of major powers competing for the throne to become a hegemon, which is happening right now. Because of course, as we all know that the United States is the superpower economically and uh, militarily speaking, but it is being uh, contested by major powers now. You have our China, Russia, India, and some other um, great powers trying to contest the position of the United States right now as a hegemon. So in 17th century, just like what is happening right now in the 21st century, we are seeing this concert of powers, basically. And then basically, we also experience colonialism, imperialism, secessionism, and terrorism. You know, I always keep uh, telling my students that the mother of all these uh, problems that we have is colonialism that relates to all the isms in the world. You have imperialism and secessionism or separatism and terrorism because, you know, people doesn't want to be imposed with other powers. That's the reason why they secede and you see resistance and rebellion and that's caused by colonialism, basically. Now, so basically that's how we look at security from the archeological anthropological perspective of it, how it originated and how it affects humanity basically. Now, um, then we've seen the rise of nations and um, the concept of national security as we call it the politics of, of, of national security basically. And from monarchy, we've seen the evolution of republic and uh, from achieving republicanism basically, um, there must be rise of uh, revolutions. And we've seen that in the uh, industrial revolution, uh, the American Revolution, uh, of course, uh, uh, where, where we've seen some of the uh, uh, contentions or issues on slavery, the French Revolution, where, of course, um, fraternity, equality, camarader camaraderie were um, basic uh, um, ideas of rights, basically, basically. And then the Haitian Revolution, of course, same with the, with the uh, American Revolution on slavery, Serban Revolution, we're trying to get rid from the USSR, Latin American Wars of Independence, of course, basically uh, to get rid from uh, colonialism and typing revolution where we saw the formation of China. So from there on, revolutions, then we saw world wars. And we know for a fact what happened in World War I, it's a family feud of monarchies. And they're trying to um, strengthen their armed forces because they want to expand. And that is an insatiable need for humans to expand. Remember when our ancestors went out of Africa and they migrated to different parts of the world because of that insatiable desire to expand their territories. It's a need. They want some security because of course, if they just stay from Africa, naturally they get threatened from other mammals and animals. But all of a sudden they saw some greener pasture and we've seen that also in some of the Netflix uh, productions in the uh, Vikings and uh, some other um, productions there where you see humans search, get out from their territories and expand. And we saw that also in World Wars because of that need for expansionism because that's power in itself. And then in World War II, we, sh we saw the, 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 the competition of nation states. And breaking out from the monarchy and definitely achieving republicanism at the time. And then in Cold War, basically, this is a competition of ideologies between democracy and communism, basically. And, and recently in the 21st century, we saw three war where economics played a major role on what makes a country powerful. So basically, if we try to look at these politics of nations and national security here, it's very nation-centric. Then all of a sudden, we see in some discourses, debates, and resistance of the schools of thought, where scholars are trying to decipher how come that even if we try to secure nations, we don't get world peace, because the world is such an anarchic world. And we've put much emphasis on nations. That's the reason why you have national security. And then all of a sudden, these scholars try to decipher that maybe the problem there is we give too much emphasis on, emphasis on nation, but we don't get a lot of freedom that we want. So 
the recourse is to focus on human security. And we will discuss that later on. Why all of a sudden, when we talk about security studies now, there is a shift on the object and subject of security from national security to human security, basically. Now, let's uh, try to look at how they conceptualize national security, um, looking at how major powers uh, looked at national security and how they use it as an instrument to protect their own national interests. Remember, when we talk is security, interest is very powerful idea because basically that would help you understand what are your needs for your interests. And of course, basically, um, we know for a fact that um, the strongest nation right now is still the United States, given that uh, it is being threatened right now by different uh, st uh, state and non-state actors. And the U.S. National Security Act of 1947, amended in 1949, says that the act to promote the national security by providing in Secretary of Defense, National Military Establishment, Department of Army, Navy, Air Force, or the Division of, Division of National Military Establishment, and so on. So basically, in that National Security Act of 1947, there was no a definition of national security, but it was used only for the creation or formation of its national defense. Because at the time, after World War II, the US was um, assuming its role as the new superpower. And definitely they have to project a muscular defense or military basically. And of course, later on we will see that more, um, that, that, that idea was also copied by the Philippines, basically. And we will see that in our discussion later on. So you see, um, looking at the, 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 the act itself of 1947, uh, it kind of uh, helped the US to, um, to, to basically um, um, define the terms of intelligence and foreign intelligence and counterintelligence because at the time there was competition between superpowers that would be later on to Cold War. And uh, definitely you need to learn how to gather intelligence reports or you know, spy espionage that has become a thing for securing national security. And we know for a fact that um, uh, the KGB of the USSR or later on Russia is very strong and powerful up to now. But of course, we know for a fact that Israel has the widest and strongest um, intelligence no? and um, practices. And um, of course, you have the CIA uh, for, for, for the United States. So they use that as a form of securing their, securing their nation. So in other words, there was no definition of national security. It's only an instrument of creating their um, muscular defense establishment and how they would succeed on intelligence for intelligence and counterintelligence. Now, of course, um, national security, this is how they look at it, is uh, the requirement to maintain the survival of the state through the use of economic power, diplomacy, power projection, and political power. The concept developed mostly in the United States after World War II. If you try to look of it, uh, if you try to look what, at it, um, it's very political economic in its essence because they use economic power, diplomacy, which is very important also in uh, creating uh, alliances and getting the support of other nations uh, with your foreign policy and power projection because we're trying to project that you are strong so that you don't get threatened or you can demand basically. And it's a political power and powerful is a very flowery and powerful. And you know, through the power later on, we will discuss that uh, the different types of power basically. And the, the, the instruments of power that the United States uh, use basically in its survival to become the undisputed superpower uh, for, from, from 20th century to 21st century. Now, um, this is um, the US national security in 1977, you see? It's only in 1945, after the war, 47 basically, and then 1997, 
took almost uh, three decades for them to actually there's no definition it was only uh, u.s secretary harold brown of uh, defense u.s secretary of defense when he tried to perhaps define it uh, what is national security basically for the americans and for him he said that national security then is the ability to preserve the nation's physical integrity and territory so you see how geography works or, uh, you know, for a fact, uh, geography is also important in securing, um, um, secu uh, in securing uh, sovereignty and um, uh, national interests and uh, national security, basically. It maintains economic relations with the rest of the world on reasonable terms to preserve its nature, institution, and governance from disruption from outside. See the keyword there, disruption, and to control its borders. So you see national security was used as a tool to secure the interest of a nation. And if you use it properly, you can gain a lot of support and benefits for your people and your country, basically. So that's how dramatic uh, national security was being used in the United States uh, for the protection of its integrity, physical integrity, and territory, and so on. Now, Russia is also a major power, a contender in the Baltic region. And uh, basically, um, there's a lot of question, what is the national interest of Russia? And uh, it took them for a while to better understand their national security. It's only in 1997 and 2000 that Russia ad adopted the documents titled National Security Concept. And that described Russia's global position and the country's interests, listed threats to national security, and described the means to conquer those threats. And only in 2009, these documents were superseded by the national security strategy of 2020. So it's only recently where they use national security as a concept, basically, for their own insatiable desires and needs. And um, they also have the Security Council of Russia, which uh, we also have the National Security Council in the Philippines. So, mainly say Russia also tried to emulate what other great powers are doing. Because when you think of national security, you have to reflect and understand your national interest. It took them a lot of time to reflect and understand it, which we will see later on with other civilizational powers like, you know, um, India and China, but basically let's go back to, to Russia here. And for them, national security concept of the Russian Federation is a system of views on how to secure the individual, society, and state. So remember, there are three variables there, individual, society, and state, against external and internal threats in every sphere of national life. So there are many variables. You're talking about external and internal also when you talk about security. And it articulates the major trust of the Russian Federation's foreign policy. Because basically when we talk about national security, you are exposing and highlighting your foreign policy, basically. Now, and uh, for the Russian national security uh, strategy of 2020 of Russia, no, uh, uh, the new strat strategy breaks the trend, it says there, with its upbeat tone and air of aspiration and its step away from the narrative of victimhood. Because we know for a fact that during the Cold War, Russia, USSR basically uh, failed and lost that competition. And you saw the formation of Russia and they felt that uh, they became victims of these ideological differences. So now they turn around and try to reconstruct their national security, that we are powerful and we don't play that narrative of victimhood. So you see the kind of uh, transformation. Because basically when you talk about national security, it also deals with the strategic culture. How do you translate it to people and how do you transform as a nation also so that your people will have a transformative idea on how to help you in nation building? That is a big question here in the Philippines because 
even our leaders don't have that notion of national security. That's the reason why even up to now, we feel the narratives of defeat and victimhood, which we will see later on in our discussion. Now, for India, um, although for them, national security is third, but the highest for them is national resilience. It's the same thing as what Indonesia is using in terms of how they conceptualize national security. But for them, national security is an appropriate and aggressive blend of political resilience and maturity, human resources, economic structure and capacity, technological competence, industrial base, and availability of natural resources, and finally, the military might. That's the definition according to National Defense of India. And you see there are many dimensions that they try to inculcate in their concept of national security. Well, politics, human resources, economics, technology, natural resources, military. See, there are six dimensions that they are talking about which we will see later on, on the instruments of power or the dimensions on national security, which we will be discussing later on. Now, India thought that it only took them also five time. Remember, this is one of the longest uh, civilizational states in the, world, in the world. And it took them only in 2019 to better understand their national security. And for them, National security is an all-encompassing term that includes the protection of a nation and its citizens from a range of multidimensional threats and coercion. The overwhelming scope of his strategy to deal with these threats is a fast-evolving national and international landscape is sometimes a hindrance in formalizing national security strategy. So when you see, you, you have all the dimensions that we so in some other countries, how they looked at national security and also the dichotomy or the binary opposition of the external and the internal. So we see that there, we see some patterns on how they define or how they look national security. Because when we talk about national security, it's also a reflection of the national character and national culture or, or the culture of the people of a certain state. Mean to say it's also multidimensional in India. That means that they have a lot of insecurities to address for them to achieve national security or national resiliency. Now, let's go to China. You know, China, um, they're trying to understand also their national security because they are being threatened. And as the second largest economy in the world, they have that um, ambition to become the number one and overpass the United States in terms of its economic prowess, military strength, and also as a superpower. And for them, uh, national security is an all-encompassing concept, same as what India is talking about, same as what the US has in mind. And they concocted, created this measurement on how to achieve that national security. They have this comprehensive national power no? And this is a putative measure important in the contemporary political thought of the People's Republic of China of the general power of a nation state. So they have their own measurement because basically some of the literatures when you measure power is very Western centric or Western oriented. You have the, 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 the soft power, the, the, the soft power, and then the, the, the uh, what are the other powers? Uh, the hard power. And then uh, there's the smart power. These are Western oriented uh, uh, conditioning of the mind. So now you measure power. But for China, they created their own, which is called the comprehensive national power. And I remember when I studied Beijing, they were using this ready as a form of measurement. And of course, China is not uh, on that lead. Uh, you have Canada and some European powers, uh, states as um, higher, uh, with higher um, standing compared to China, meaning to say that, that they're still trying to improve. And now we're talking about China as a second largest economy using that kind of comprehensive national power as measurement of how to gauge their national interests. 
Now, let's go to the Philippines. And uh, it was mentioned earlier, uh, the definition of, um, of national security. Uh, Dr. Um, Dominic um, mentioned about this uh, term is a state or condition wherein the people's welfare, well-being, ways of life, government, and its institutions, it, uh, integ uh, territorial integrity, sovereignty, and the core values are advanced. Um, it's very American, basically, uh, in its definition. Uh, this definition actually came from the national security policy from 2017 to 2022. But of course, um, there were many... Um, um, debates on how you basically um, define national security in the Philippines. And uh, um, this was adopted by the National Security, uh, by the National Defense College. That's the reason why later on, as we discuss, there are six dimensions when we talk about national security in the Philippines. It's part of the comprehensive security because there are different approaches also when you look at uh, national security, basically. And um, before going that, uh, before going to the next slide, um, you see it's a state or condition. It's a mental, uh, cerebral thing, a cerebral thing. It's a framework basically, but it talks about people and people being at the center of that security. And it says it about its welfare and well-being and life. So you see how important people, when we discuss about national security. Okay, that's how the Philippines views about it. Now, in 2013, I tried to understand better how did we come up with our definition of national security and trying to look at the, I'm trying to indigenize it or Filipinize it. And uh, you know when we I ask my students whether military or uniform and non uniform um, students, if I would ask them about security, what is the word that would translate security in the Philippines? Of course, they have many ideas, and the National Defense College uh, Alumni Association they use the word katiwasayan. And definitely, uh, we have also this um, hymn in NDCP. But before going there, uh, I asked them, what would uh, do you mean when we talk about uh, security? Uh, the, there are words where they would um, uh, put a synonym to security such as kapayapaan, peace, kapanatagan, safe, secure, kaginhawaan, comfort, katatagan, firmness, stability, kapahingahan, peace, repose, quietness, katimawaan, I think this is a Visayan word, liberation, emancipation, freedom, Kaligtasan, protection, katibayan, endurance, katahimikan, silence, hinahon, relax, diplomatic. So basically, those are some of the words when we think of security. But nothing beats the true essence of security because those words have other meanings, basically. And uh, in the NDCP hymn, which was uh, composed by the... Um, class of um, um, the, the, I forget the, the name of this Kuwanko. Um, she used to be the uh, president of the, um, the mother of Mikey Kuwanko. I forgot her, her name, but basically she used to be the president of the PPSC, the Philippine Public Safety. Remember, security is different from uh, safety. Security is more encompassing. Safety is about protection of the people. That's why the, the police are using safety. The military uses security. That's the difference, basically. Okay? Uh, in, in this hymn, it says there, um, sa pagtatanggol ng bayat bandila, ang katatagan ang tanging lunas sa katiwasayan ng Pilipinas. When we say katatagan, it means secure, safe, um, uh, or being safe. For to, to be safe, the only solution is security. It says in this um, hymn, as a form of literature, where we would like to translate security basically in the Philippines. So that's the reason why when we talk about security, it's always like this, no? It's always external. You don't say, panatag ang labas. You always say, you know, 
panatag ang loob ko. Right? That's why in the Chinese character of security, it's a character of a woman inside the house. So it makes that a house more secure when there's a woman inside. And if we look at the Philippine culture, um, the woman or the wife in the Philippine household is the ilaw ng tahanan. The more the family is secure where there is ilaw ng tahanan. That's why you have panatag ang loob. It's very internal. That's why if you look at the Tagalog word for the Department of National Defense, kagawaran ng tanggulang panlabas. It's always panlabas when we talk security. That's the reason why in our constitution, it says there that when it comes to security, that's the role of the military to protect and secure us, our sovereign national, uh, inter uh, national territorial integrity and sovereignty. That should be the role of the military. But it seems like when it comes to the security sector, the military has more credibility when it comes to the police. That's the reason why uh, when it comes to internal security. You cannot prove by example. So, so kahit marami ka example binigay, hindi pa rin enough uh, yun. The, the, okay. So when it comes to, to that, even the, 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 um, the, the, um, the, the military, it's more of the external. And uh, that's the reason why, because lack of the police, uh, in terms of the credibility, they also, um, the, the, the military is also being used by the government in its internal security. That's why when it comes to terrorism, which is supposedly the role of the police, we see the military uh, doing a lot of things also in curbing terrorism. Okay, I'll try to do fast uh, to, to, to fast track uh, with my, my presentation so that we can have time for the Q&A later on. Economics of national security. This, this is uh, the only time when uh, national security was being, um, um, was being um, defined. Uh, Barry Buzan is the giant when it comes, a giant thinker when it comes to, to security studies. And he says that the security is taken to be about the pursuit of freedom from threat and the ability of states and societies to maintain their independent identity and their functional integrity against forces of change, which they see as hostile. So it's very realist in its uh, construction, basically. But uh, that's the definition of uh, Barry Buzan there. And uh, it says, sir, that. Um, the many changes in the international community which affect content of traditional and national security concepts have occurred in recent years. It is suggested that cooperative model of international security may represent the starting point of the forming of a new and more efficiently adjusted national and global security structure in the modern world. Many say that there are many ways on how to look at national security because of the different approaches, basically. Okay, um, these are some of the approaches that I mentioned earlier cooperative security, it's very, very uh, European-centric um, process whereby countries with common interests work jointly through agreed mechanisms to reduce tensions and suspicion. That's the reason why you have the ASEAN, NATO, and the UN, where they talk about cooperation, multilateralism, security, and strategic partnership. And then uh, collective uh, security recognizes the relevance of power and accepts the fact of war as a reality. It's very um, realist uh, in its uh, approach. And uh, you have this reason why you have the UN Security Council, the ABMM, the Quad, that is very uh, real politic, realist, Armenian, Mahabela, tension, and so on. Okay, common security talks about the fact that individually, uh, a nation, and for that matter, any individual or group cannot be secured with all that other nations. And then the, uh, we talk about natural disasters, human uh, disasters, and so on, cybersecurity, and so on. Okay, this is where. Uh, we come from the comprehensive secu security, an approach that goes beyond the traditional realist, state-centric and military approach and includes human, economic, and environmental dimensions, as well as a subjective feeling of security or insecurity of individuals initiated by Japan and ASEAN. Okay. Now, I told you that for the longest time since the construction of national security from security, the national security, then all of a sudden in 1994, there was this initiative to perhaps focus on human security. And human security reveals the people-centered and multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary understanding of security, which involves a number of research, research fields, 
including development studies, international relations, strategic studies, and human rights. This is the reason why your, our team for today on the interdisciplinarity of national security is very important because we see the divergence and the fusion of different uh, disciplines when we talk about security, basically, and the uh, national security that would translate to, uh, that, 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 that shifts now to human security. And that kind of shift basically uh, was seen in some of the uh, words and speeches of, uh, of world leaders before, uh, in the Four Freedom Speech in 1941, uh, Roosevelt was talking about human security already. The ASEAN uh, uh, chair, uh, Sorin Pitsuan, uh, he discusses about the uh, human security in these um, in some of his speeches before. So it's not new, but although the, the acceptance in the academia and of course in policymaking uh, came about in 1994, when of course um, this human security was pitched by a uh, Pakistani economist uh, during his report as reaction to the UN's 1995 World Summit on Social Development in Copenhagen. Uh, Copenhagen. So there are seven of the human security that talks about the economic security, food security, health security, environmental security, personal security, community, and political security. So those are some of the different uh, um, uh, um, human security um, needs of the people. Of course, it depends on how you look at it. Of course, uh, in, in, in both sides, you have this uh, notion of traditional security to non-traditional security. Basically, traditional security becomes when the state becomes an actor, but it becomes non-traditional when non-state actors are the primary actors in those um, um, dealings, basically. So those are some of the differences. And then there was also the difference between societal security to individual security, where societal security looks at the development of, um, of, 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 um, of uh, societies, basically, uh, in the context of Cold War. And of course, you have individual security with the protection of the basic human uh, rights of individuals. Now, um, in the States, they use this perspective on the instruments of power and how they secure. Uh, remember, um, there was no definition of national security, but they tried to understand and fully utilize their national security perspective. There, they have this diplomatic, informational, military, and economic. That's the dimensions that they use when they talk about national security. There, that's the reason why they have a strong embassies, and of course, they promote a lot of their foreign policies and it affects the uh, foreign policies of uh, na different nations. And informational, they're very good. That's the reason why they have used also, um, uh, they created a lot of uh, social media as part of their informational strategies, you have Facebook, um, Instagram, Twitter, and so on. Military, definitely, um, strongest uh, so far. They are still the uh, uh, naval power. Economics, yeah, uh, although we see some decline in their economics a little lately, but uh, uh, American uh, economy is still uh, the number one in the world. Um, in the Philippines, where we use the comprehensive uh, security framework, we have these uh, different dimensions, political, economic, social, cultural, techno scientific, environmental, military. And uh, that's the reason why, uh, why we have uh, six dimensions, because basically we have a lot of things to resolve in our insecurities. That's why we have to address it. Uh, these different um, dimensions of national security. And uh, uh, the Development Academy uh, is using uh, this uh, a different perspective on development and security, basically. And uh, the question to which one comes first, is, is it development or security or security over development? So some, those are some of the perspectives that uh, security studies in the Philippines are also evolving, basically, to address the needs of our society. Okay, now, um, when we try to look at security, we have to consider that uh, it comes with different uh, analysis, units of analysis. You have to use security in local, national, and regional, and global perspective. Because basically what happens globally may affect what happens in the, lo uh, in the local. That's why you have the local perspective also. Last few slides here. Some, these are some of the theories when it comes to, to national security, but basically these are more important. The security realism, where um, realism has dominated study of security to a significant extent. It, this is um, um, 
uh, dominated in the language of security, uh, to realize a perspective where anarchy and the absence of power we, uh, to regulate interactions between states are very prominent. And then uh, security idealism, basically, uh, rational actors are capable of ensuring lasting peace. That's the reason why you have the concept of world peace. And then, of course, this is now the most dominant uh, theory, whether in international relations, also in these security studies, where you have constructivism that believes that national interests are forged in the process of mutual interaction, and the process determines the interest and identity, and the identity constitutes the interest, because it's more interpretative, it's more um, constructive, basically. And people actively construct or make their own knowledge, and the reality is determined by your experience as a, as a, as a learner. So basically, lastly, this would be my last slide. When we talk about security, whether national security or human security in that essence, you have to remember these keywords that it is VUCAD, that security is vulnerable, uncertain, complex, ambiguous, and disruptive. Whatever happens now, it may change five seconds later on. It's very, it's changing, it's, it's evolving, and it's very vulnerable. So, ladies and gentlemen, I hope that you learned from this lecture, and I'm looking forward for the Q&A, of course, with the reaction first. Thank you very much. Turning it to you now, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Dr. Cabaza, for the very insightful and comprehensive talk on national security. We would also like to relay our most profuse apologies for the interruption in the middle of your discussion. Now, to our audiences, we would like to gently remind you the protocol for this webinar, and not just this webinar, but any online forum that you attend in general. Please remember to put your setting of, the, of your device for mute and only use the unmute if you're going to be sharing something using your audio. So that said, we will be proceeding to our reaction. Weighing in with his perspective, we have Mr. Oliver Fabricante. Thank you, uh, Dr. Juntado. Um, Magandang umaga po. Una sa lahat, gusto kong magpasalamat sa ating resource speaker, Dr. Chester Cabalsta, ngayong umaga sa pagbabahagi ng kanyang kaalaman at oras sa programa ng Interdisciplinary Studies ng Institute of Arts and Sciences ng Far Eastern University. In the book of Joseph Rome entitled Defining National Security, he mentioned the night code. In 1950, Harold Laswell noted that our greatest security lies in the best balance of all instruments of foreign, of foreign policy. You know, the presence of coordinated handling of arms, diplomacy, information, and economics. And this statement by, by Laswell you know, is mirrored and is reflected you know, by the uh, context, definition, and um, the theories shared with us this morning by Dr. Cabalsa. Let me just first start with uh, his statement wherein his statement about war that threatens humanity. After the war, the efforts to protect and promote the well-being of the people come into play. National security, as he mentioned, shifts to human security. And again, national security does not only limit in um, protecting the, the interest of the, the nation with respect to their power or to the extent of power. But again, it was reiterated in the in the discussion, in the presentation, that there is a shift from national security to human security, which is very vital in understanding the very broad concept of security. Let me continue by uh, 
mentioning again that national security is a requirement to maintain survival of the state through the use of economic power. Dr. Cabasa mentioned this, and it speaks well of the interdisciplinarity of national security. Because there will be no national security if the political affairs and the economic affairs would not come into play. Time and again, Dr. Cabasa mentioned about the economic activities that is involved in order to promote national security. And again, the economic power is very important because how can a nation influence the world? How can a nation promote the goodwill that the presence of a nation would promote national security or maybe international security if the economic power or aspect of a particular state is not established. What I'm saying is, in order to understand um, national security, politics and economic activities must come into play. And this is interdisciplinarity of national security. He also mentioned the transformation of societies. I am positive that um, this is for a better society. If the objectives of national security is achieved, this speaks well of an attempt to improve the lives of the people. And then again, the sociological aspect of this is very evident. Um, let me just uh, fast track a bit. He mentioned about um, Filipinizing security. No? And then, the definition of katiwasayan drives us to a point of being mentally secured as citizens. And again, if one is secured, th that sense of uh, feeling of being secured, it will cascade to a better society that leads to transformation. And again, the betterment of the society or the involvement of culture is again one of the areas covered by national security. One last point. Um, there are a lot of good, um, good inputs, context, and definitions mentioned by Dr. Cabalsa. No? I do not have sufficient time to discuss everything, but then again, I would like to. Uh, Note on this last uh, item, security is ambiguous. If security is ambiguous, the more that there is a need to use the interdisciplinary approach to understand national security. Because one discipline cannot achieve the objectives of national security. Another thing, he, he highlighted cooperative security to pursue economic development. Again, uh, do not, we cannot discount the fact of the economic activities in order to promote the goals of national security. And, and, and I think that is the major takeaway that um, us being in, us being on understanding or learning about the interdisciplinarity of national security we must zero in on the economic development and the political and the in, its interplay with the political affairs because this cannot be disengaged in order to uh, in order to achieve the goals of national security and then let me let me just end this uh, reaction uh, with this uh, statement by the late president uh, Nino Yakin uh, by the last late president Benigno Aquino. Our quest must not only focus on ensuring stability of the state and the security of our nation. The ultimate goal must be the safety and well-being of our people. The quality of life of the people and the best interest of the nation will be realized if we mobilize the powerful impact of the interdisciplinarity of national security. Thank you very much. And uh, again, uh, 
I hope you were able to um, gain some insights from my reaction to the presentation. Thank you. Indeed, we did. Thank you very much, Mr. Fabriganti. So we'll now be proceeding to the open forum. If you have any questions, please write them down in the chat box. And for those who are tuned in to our program at the uh, the Facebook accounts for FEU and um, yeah, or the pages rather for FEU, you may write your inquiries there and we will be relaying them here. So we have one question already prepared. What is uh, What are the major differences of the old Human Security Act of 2017 and the new anti-terrorism law of 2020? Is it really necessary to create this new law for the purpose of Philippine national security? Okay, that's a very, very good question. Interesting, uh, given that, uh, of course, that has been the debate lately. Uh, when we talk about... Um, the um, Human Security Act of uh, 2007, basically, there's a misnomer uh, in that law because how come that uh, it talks about the human security when it's an anti-terrorism law, basically. And in that uh, law, there was no definition of terrorism, which in the new anti-terrorism law of uh, 2020, it tried to, to expand in, in its scope and also tried to um, define it, but it was not uh, able to define it uh, refinely. And um, the difference is that um, it also includes uh, communist terrorists and how it um, punishes also other stakeholders. Uh, because in the first anti terrorism law of uh, 2007, most of the punishments are really uh, ridiculous and um, humongous in terms of the punishment. Because, uh, like, say, for example, uh, 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 a terrorist can uh, put into a house arrest and will have to pay half a million um, pesos every day uh, if uh, not proven, if, if, if proven uh, guilty as a terrorist. That's the reason why in the um, anti-terrorism law or the Human Security Act of 2007, um, the law has not teeth, basically. And we saw Marabu siege, the Zambuaga standoff after that law, but it seems like the law did not take effect. So there was no chilling effect of that anti-terrorism law of uh, 2007. But in this law, which uh, does not have um, um, a landmark case yet also, um, expounded also its uh, teeth to uh, foreign terrorist fighters because of what happened in Marawi and in uh, Zamboanga. And definitely uh, it also expanded its teeth to communist terrorists. That's why you have the, the, the red tagging, <laughs> as we have known, uh, which became a, a debate last year amidst the pandemic. And then uh, basically um, uh, there are other um, um, provisions in that law where uh, we see um, some uh, blurring, uh, um, uh, blurring uh, definition when it comes to terrorism and its um, implementing rules and regulations, basically. So all in all, I must agree that um, the intention of the uh, Human Security Act or the anti-terrorism uh, law of uh, 2007 is to quell um, uh, is to quell basically terrorists, but the uh, anti-terrorism law of um, the uh, of 2020 is to quell basically communist terrorists and to simply um, uh, put some uh, legal um, posture to the war on drugs that the government is trying to. Um, uh, to, 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 of course, no, to stand by, basically. So those are my comments. Thank you for that. Um, our next question comes from Crit Padilla, from, or Padilla, rather, sorry, uh, from IDS 1101. What or who do you think is the main threat to Philippine national security? You know, that's a good question no? because uh, in the Philippines and in some other countries, they usually rank what are the top security issues because uh, 
um, you know, there are many dimensions when we talk about national security. And uh, basically, internally, I would say that the insurgency uh, would be the topmost uh, problem when it comes to security. Uh, it is a protracted warfare, warfare so far. It's a protracted uh, civil war that uh, the military has not uh, put an end yet. Uh, we've seen other uh, neighboring uh, countries in Southeast Asia where insurgency halted, was halted, and uh, it has ended already. But it seems like in the Philippines, uh, insurgency also was uh, can be used for the sentiments of separatism and, and, and terrorism, basically. That's why internally that becomes a problem. And of course, with insurgency comes the problems of insecurities like poverty, miseducation, social injustices, and religious uh, discrimination and uh, gender um, inequalities, basically. That's the reason why our country has not yet arrived as a nation state because of the many insecurities that uh, we have so far. But externally, of course, definitely the number one uh, top, uh, the number one external um, security threat would be the West Philippine Sea. And uh, we've uh, seen that how we battle so far um, uh, a major power like China. And we've heard a lot of uh, defeatist um, pronouncements coming from this incumbent government. And that has become a problem because if we try to look at it, uh, given all the colonial experiences that we have, we've seen a lot of defeatist rhetorics coming from our leaders. And that is a problem because it only shows the kind of defeatist culture that we have. It doesn't strengthen our mentality and our vision of a stronger national security or national uh, identity or basically our infrastructure to building a nationhood. So that becomes a problem. So aside from the, the, the so that's how we look at it because in security, they, all, they always uh, have this dichotomy of the internal and external. Although some uh, security uh, analysts now are trying to say that uh, why do you have to divide it from external and internal when in fact that is the entirety of security? So it's so hard to list down which one is the topmost because basically if you try to equate it, the insurgency and all the other insecurities on poverty and so on, and so with the external defense on the West Philippine Sea are basically some of the top contenders when it comes to national security in the Philippines. So I guess those are some of my um, uh, answers to that. Okay. Our next question comes from Jaron Denzel Perfecto. Mm. Could the drug wars and martial law, despite its propaganda, still be seen as security efforts by their respective governments? Right. Okay. Um, there are two perspectives or a school of thought when we try to to resolve that issue on the war of drugs. Of course, basically... Um, it would be a, a school of thought of a uh, punitive or it is restorative. Although in, 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 in the study or scholastics when it comes to um, war on drugs worldwide, there is no country in the world that has succeeded in curbing the war on drugs. And of course, um, the Philippines is not an exception to that. We tried our best with the five years uh, almost six years of um, this uh, incumbent government trying to to and put an end to to drug war. It seems like uh, they have not uh, secured a better formula on how to end it. Although, if you try to look at the uh, put uh, punitive uh, structure of it, of course, by law, uh, you have the talk hung right now, and uh, they use uh, coercive force. That's the reason why uh, the police and the military, particularly the police, and of course uh, the the National Drug uh, Agency are basically uh, uh, put at the forefront on how to curb that uh, put, uh, punitive um, and to, to, to drug war. And it did not, uh, of course, we know for a fact that it didn't succeed basically. And we saw a lot of human rights issues and a lot of death and blood war so far when it comes to that, uh, uh, to that uh, intervention. Uh, on the uh, drug war using a punitive uh, mechanism. But uh, for, for the health department, which they are trying to, uh, to, to alleviate, uh, elevate the, 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 the restorative uh, uh, way of doing that uh, war on drug, it did not also succeed. Because, of course, no, uh, there are many interventions or mechanisms. And I've, been, I've also done a lot of studies on that 
uh, with the Department of Health on how to curb that. Of course, uh, given uh, the 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 um, ways, different ways of a uh, of a uh, restorative uh, ways of, of of ending the war on crack. But it seems like it didn't succeed until such a time you have the pandemic, which basically disrupted the efforts of the Department of Health on how to foster and uh, that um, ways to end the drug war. Because of course, uh, we have more imminent uh, problem, national security problem when it comes to the COVID-19 pandemic. And still the COVID-19 pandemic is something that we did, we did not succeed also as a nation state compared to other uh, ASEAN uh, nations like uh, Vietnam and uh, uh, Thailand and Singapore. So <laughs> if we try to do a comparative study on it, um, when it comes to drug war, basically around the world, um, the Philippines has not succeeded. It failed basically on how to curb that. Uh, I think that there was a second question for, aside from the drug war. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dominic, uh, what was the other uh, question aside from the drug war? Uh, the, mar the one on martial law. Uh, martial law, okay. Yeah. The problem with the martial law, although by law it was allowed, and even in the history of the Philippines, from Spanish, American, and uh, most particularly during the Japanese period, we saw martial law was being imposed and, uh, uh, um, in the Philippines. And of course, um, uh, how would I say it? Um, the kind of um, 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 a strong man leadership was um, being, being implemented in those periods. That's the reason why. Um, uh, um, these kinds of um, of of of, of uh, laws or um, how would I say it? These kinds of norms, political norms, are not new in the uh, in the Philippines. Um, it only happened that, of course, we borrowed uh, the concept of democracy, and then um, sometimes the problem when a concept is borrowed, and then we infuse it in our culture, we don't know how to use it properly. Sometimes we overuse it and sometimes we try to limit it also. That's the reason why democracy in the Philippines is still immature in its nature basically because we don't know how to properly utilize this kind of concept. But uh, martial law basically under this uh, current regime was used in Mindanao at first because basically to quell the terrorists. And we know for a fact that uh, we've seen um, the Marawi siege and the Zamboanga standoff there. That's the reason why the martial law was put into context. But nonetheless, did it succeed? 50-50 um, in Mindanao. Uh, in, a, in some areas, yes, but uh, definitely uh, we saw also the discriminations of the indigenous peoples and the Lumads. And of course, basically, um, the protracted uh, issue on insurgency and uh, separatism and terrorism are still there. That's the reason why, even if you impose martial law, it is not a good intervention to end this national security threat in the Philippines vis-a-vis -vis in Mindanao. Okay, in the, in the Philippines, if we try to impose martial law, basically, uh, it's a gas-gas overuse already because basically, uh, we don't know how to properly use that concept of martial law. When in fact, even in the United States, sometimes they use martial law to if there are emergency threats. But in the Philippines, um, the, the martial law was used because of some interest also of the of our leaders. And sometimes um, there is that fear that when you put the military there, there is fear of, of the original martial law of what happened in 1970s. The historical context of martial law is still very strong and alive in our consciousness that if we try to use it now, the context of martial law in its uh, purest definition which is supposed to be good, becomes so bad. That becomes a problem there. So the question now is um, how, um, how, how useful is martial law basically in the, in, 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 in the Philippines? And I think uh, for me, uh, it depends on the circumstances and who leads basically. Because if, if uh, the military will be used for some uh, personal interest of, um, of the incumbent leader, or, or any leader for that matter, then it becomes contentious. But if it is properly uh, addressed and defined and uh, using uh, and, 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 and expressed in its scope and delimitation, then it is advisable to be used, basically. 
Yeah, that's my point, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, to our audiences, uh, rest assured that your questions are going to be addressed in the order that we've been receiving them. We're very blessed to have an excellent audience that is very interactive today. Mm, very good. Okay, so from Patrick Kenneth Colala. Good morning, Paul, and thank mm. you, Mr. Fabricante, for your powerful reaction and Dr. Cabalza on your very insightful lecture. Mm. I have a question, Paul, for our resource speaker. Do you think that the ideology of the current leader of a government influences how the state perceives its national concerns, particularly no, primarily its security and diplomacy to other nations? Definitely. You know, this, this, uh, this current incumbent um, leader is very um, colorful, basically, because uh, it uh, has placed the Philippines at the world map, uh, sometimes in good light and uh, sometimes not so good because of the promiscuity of our foreign relations. We used to depend so much with the United States and all of a sudden, given the pronouncement of the independent foreign policy, which is by our constitution, it... Um, uh, it is um, allowed for a president to do that, but in its definition, which is very blurry and flip-flopping, basically, it did not translate. And what we did was to depend so much with Beijing and to extend our belief that perhaps Moscow will also be there to support us. But, you know, the promiscuity did not enter. And uh, now we are also extending some of our uh, foreign policy uh, dependence on the Quad and with the uh, Paris and some other European powers like, uh, 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 of course, Germany, and of course now with the AUKUS, no? Australia and the uh, US and of course the, the, the United Kingdom. So we need to say that uh, that's good when we diversify because we don't only depend on one country now, which we use for so long, for so many decades. And because of that special uh, law on the Mutual Defense Treaty, and then, of course, with the VFA, that it's only America that can help us. And America could become our knight in shining armor, which, which America did not do at the height of the West Philippine Sea Kununtu. We were expecting that the U.S. would be there, but it seems like um, that the problem was not resolved. And given that the, even if we have the Hague ruling to support us, which was placed uh, before into a limelight and now it's in the back burner because of the current pronouncement on foreign policy. You know, we need to see that the foreign policy, which is, which should be uh, is institutionalized in some extent, like uh, uh, the West Philippine Sea case, it was used by our leaders for their own personal interest. And that has become a problem on how to distinguish personal interest to national interest because some of our leaders cannot understand national security per se. That's why their national security concept becomes personal security. So you see the biases and some of the Waterloo when it comes to the concept of national security here. And since it's timely that we are having this kind of discussion, talking about national security and because of the upcoming elections, by May 2022, with your power now to choose who would lead us. You have to choose a leader that knows and talks about national security. In our discussion earlier, there are many ways on how to understand national security and there are many dimensions. It's very complicated. And if you think that the leader knows well of this, and given that all the many problems we have in the Philippines on insurgency, the West Philippine Sea issue, poverty, and so on, then you have to choose a leader that has, who has a platform to address these national security issues. The power is in your hands now. And majority of those who will choose our next leader, next president comes from your generation. So use your power wisely. It is in your hands, actually. The future of the Philippines is in your hands. If you have to choose the right leader with right platforms, better platforms to address us and elevate us from poverty and to become, and make our country an upper middle class country, then so be it. You have now the right and power to do that. Don't miss that power because it is the right thing to do. Yeah, that's my answer. 
our our next contribution for questions comes from Kat Almadin. I think she wants to use her audio for this inquiry. Sure, sure. Go ahead, Kat. Hello, can you hear me, Paul? Yeah, yes, yeah, it's loud and clear. Thank you. Um, um, my name is Katina Isabella Almadin. I am from BA Interdisciplinary Studies. Mm. My question is, um, is there a certain process we should uh, we should follow to attain national security? Because mm. it was mentioned earlier that when we talk about uh, national security, there are external and internal variables we should consider. Mm. Um, so which of these variables should we focus on first? Or should should we fo mm. can we focus on both simultaneously? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if we look at our current national situation, many mm. Filipinos do not feel a sense of security. Yeah. For instance, our indigenous people. Mm. There is an article written about how our indigenous people, specifically the Lumads, mm. they are being displaced. They feel like they are refugees to their own country. Mm. Even if the, the right to their own land is being protected by the Indigenous People's Rights Act, it is not Deeper. really always being followed. Yes, and right. uh, so we, they don't really feel that sense of security. And while this is happening, we are also battling in an international setting of national security conflicts, um, mm. such as the West Philippine Sea issue. Mm. So with this, uh, what should we prioritize first? Of all? Do we fix uh, first the, inter the internal variables concerning mm. our national security or do we address first the external variables? Very good. That is a very tricky question, but mm. I like it. <laughs> but basically, thanks, Scott, for that. No. Um, you know, um, it's so hard to... We start from scratch, given that uh, we have this Imungusa problem with our insecurities internally and externally. Maybe, uh, you know, national security is like a blueprint of our visions and aspirations as a nation and as a people. And the next president should be people-centric, human-centric. What does the Filipino want? Definitely, we want freedom from poverty, freedom from bullying from other aggressors, foreign aggressors. That's the reason why when we elect a leader later on, we listen to their platforms. What are their views when it comes to insurgency, to poverty, to the indigenous peoples, to the, um, to the uh, West Philippine Sea, and so on. And it's us who will assess it, reflect, so that by the time he or she becomes that president, it would be a two-way process. We help her or him secure that place to lead us by voting him or her because we believed in his or her advocacies and platforms. Vis-a-vis, -vis, let's support and help him or her also to implement those visions because basically those platforms are forms of national security whether be it internal or external. It's so hard right now to identify which one comes first because it should be a way uh, equally. Although I don't uh, believe in equality, but at least equitably, it should be weighed equitably. What are the basic needs that must be addressed now? Because sometimes when we talk, just like I told you in the last part of my slides, Security is vukad. It's vulnerable, uh, uncertain, uh, and so on, and uh, disruptive. Sometimes it attacks today, and that is the main security issue right now. And then the following day, there's another issue. So it depends. As long as the our leader and uh, that that our leader has a solid. Uh, policies, foreign policies, security policies on how to address these issues, the result would be better uh, if it's a bottom-up approach that he or she listens to us and what she or he or she knows what we want, our needs, and it will be translated through policies. 
policies will not enter because the problem in the Philippines is that we have all the bright ideas in crafting laws and policies. The main problem is how to implement it properly. We don't have, we lack that culture of action. And when it is properly implemented, sometimes we hear a lot of remorse, conflicts, and some dissatisfactions, disenfranchisement sometimes. Because once it is being implemented, naturally, majority will be affected. And sometimes we get affected, and sometimes we contradict what we have thought better for the Philippines. That becomes the problem. We should have a strong rule of law and enforcement. And sometimes when he or she does that, I mean, the next leader, and we see a lot of conflicts and uh, differences, then that becomes also, you know, it's a problem with our culture also. Our culture is a culture of agreeing to disagreeing to agreeing to disagreeing. <laughs> That's the problem because all of us have our own uh, intentions, voices, likes, and dislikes. And we tend to abuse what democracy has brought us because we thought that whatever we say, we say is democratic, is a way to democracy. But in fact, there are limitations to it. We have to respect what is proper, what is better for us. Otherwise, if we keep on doing these things, we will be trapped to that vicious cycle and we cannot go out from that. And you will only realize that when you become leaders yourself. 20 years from now, you will become leaders of this country. And you will realize that it's the same old narratives, stories that we keep on telling. What we've been discussing now, it's the same story that we will be encountering later on. And the problem there is you know the answers, but you don't know how to implement it. That's why it's a wake up call for all of us. If you don't want to be trapped in that vicious cycle of events, then let's, let us do something. And as I said, security is the only way to go out from that vicious cycle. Okay, Kat, would that suffice May your question? Yes, yeah, sir, thank you. Very good. Our next inquiry comes from one of the faculty of the Interdisciplinary Studies Department, mm -hmm. Mr. Rondel Gaspan. Mm -hmm. How can we make people become more aware of the connection between national security policies to mm -hmm. our environmental protection laws? Mm -hmm. For example, most people in social media seem to think that the West Philippine Sea issue is only limited to international relations or social political regressions. Thank you, sir. Very good. That's a nice question. But what do you think is the reason why China is there in the West Philippine Sea? It's because of food security. It's because of the natural resources that has that 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 that, that place possesses it. That's the reason why they are there. Because they need those natural resources to feed their people for their own national interest, aside from the glorification and unification of that vision that they will have to, by uh, 2049, all of those historical claims that they are claiming should be part of China. But basically, the reason why they are there because of those natural resources. And environmental dimension of national security comes place. Remember in the dimensions that I mentioned to you, dimensions of national security in the Philippines, it's interdisciplinary. You have political, economic, social, cultural, techno-scientific, environmental, and military. It should be treated equally. There's no hierarchy in that dimension. Many say that whatever happens, it's like the, that's a whole body. Whatever happens to one part of your body, it affects everything. Same as through with the West Philippine Sea. What's the reason why we are so noisy and 
definitely filing a lot of diplomatic protests when we see incursions coming from the swarming of the uh, Chinese uh, vessels there. Or why is it that we also have a, a lot of diplomatic process, protests whenever they get our resources there? Because basically, we believe that that is part of the Philippines. And it's part of the meta center of the world ecology. So that those are the things that we are fighting there. It's not only because we are part of that narrative, but because we are fighting what we are, uh, what we what belongs to ours, and also we are fighting for our environment and natural resources. And I believe in your construction of ideas that when we talk about environment, it should be part of national security. National security does not equate only to politics and diplomacy. It should go beyond that. Our people, particularly our leaders, should, better ha should have a better understanding that the environment is part of our national interest and it's part of our national security. So those, must, those things must be clear to all of us. And it's good that we are, we are having this kind of forum to propagate that kind of idea and knowledge. Otherwise, if we, don't, we lack this kind of uh, discourses, forum, fora, and discussions, then we might forget that environment is part of our national interest and national security, basically. So those are my answers to that. Thank you for that, Dr. Kabalza. We have a uh, question coming from the department chair of the mathematics department. So here comes the furtherness of our interdisciplinary scope. So uh, Mr. Genesis says, thank you, Dr. Kabalza, for the informative talk. Mm -hmm. My question is on what we is on what could we people in the sciences contribute to the attainment of national security? Thank you. Yeah, you know, um, um, national security basically is a science and art. And sometimes um, like a strategic culture where of course we, it emanates from national security uh, um, understanding. Uh, sometimes, um, a lot of um, analysts are asking if um, if it is a science, then how do we use it? Or if it is an art, when is the best time to use it, basically? And there's no formula to have a perfect national security, basically. That's why it's an arts and sciences. And sometimes it depends on the time and issue also on how we look at it, but it's also a practice. It's, it's a tradition because basically, just like I told you, national security is a reflection of our national culture and vision and aspirations because it's based from the definition itself as we've seen it. It's people-centric. It talks about the welfare of the people, its life, its society. And from the definition itself, from its archaic definition, it's from Sikura, it's the freedom from want. What do we want as a people? What is the science and art of our want? It can be quantified. Sometimes it cannot. Because basically, it is a framework and it is also a feeling. So how do you quantify a feeling? So basically you see how you weigh it. But going back to, to, to the logic of your question there, how is national security it can be translated to our um, to policies basically? there should be a uh, bottom-up approach on how to create policies. 
especially it's a two week process. Sometimes we've, we've, we've known that uh, since colonial period and to some elitist um, uh, governance that they tend to dictate what should be the content of our foreign and national security policies. And sometimes by the absence of hearing the voices of the people, what do they want? Then it becomes a problem also. Because when we translate that and offer those policies to secure people and its society and its nation, it doesn't address what we want. Like say, for example, we have the, the West Philippine Sea issue. In 2016, we won a Hague ruling stating that historical claims of China are invalid. And by 200, um, 200 uh, econ uh, uh, economic um, EZ um, that belongs to the Philippines. But how come that even up to now, we cannot even secure those perimeters that were addressed in 2016? How come that some of the foreign aggressor vessels are still uh, mining some of our natural resources in our vicinity? And that becomes a problem there. Even if that means that we don't have a unified voice, the president is telling a different tune compared to those who, compared to, to, to our own foreign policy. So you see a mismatch, a mismanagement and mispronouncements with our foreign policies. That's why it's so hard to institutionalize policies when our leaders are not knowledgeable of their own policies. That's why it's so hard to, to, you know, to quantify it or to, to, to I mean, how to see it effectively. Because at the end of the day, I see it that the Philippines still lacks the idea on how to look at national security. Because basically, when we talk about national security, it's, it's very heavy. It's very um, highly structural. And sometimes it can be so elitist in its understanding. The, 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 I think that the, the, the lesson that we can learn from, from this discussion is how do we translate it to the grassroots so that they can have a better understanding on national security. And sometimes our leaders themselves cannot even comprehend, fathom, and understand national security. Say, for example, during the the the, the Chinese uh, the 2019 uh, ramming of the Chinese uh, vessels to our Filipino vessels, fishing vessels, the role of the government is to protect our fisher folks, our fishermen. But what happened there? They felt lost. They did. They got no support. And instead of fighting for the rights, what was the intervention of the government? They gave them some super uh, ban aid supplies like uh, boats and so on, just to stop them from protesting. And that becomes a problem. How can you believe on national security if that's the intervention that you are supposed to do? So you see some of the realities of having the idea of national security and how to implement it. Because our leaders themselves don't have the knowledge and the strength to implement national security itself. We are more of a talk shop. We talk a lot, but when it comes to workshop, that, that's a problem. We don't work hard on how to implement it. I definitely agree with what you had to say about the significance of policies, Paul. And um, this is especially considering that if we if we go back to the very basis of why we have policies in the first place, hmm. we're, uh, we look at this as a measure in order to safeguard something that we're something that we're valuing. And hmm. then on another note, we're trying to keep a certain threat at bay, or yeah. to discourage those who are the source of the threat. Hmm. Because basically, some of these stakeholders mm -hmm. who should be protecting our rights 
are the same stakeholders who are on the other side of the camp. Like, say for example, we know how we won the Marawi siege. And basically that's a civil war between Filipinos, Filipino soldiers and the Muslim Filipinos. Although some of them are dubbed as terrorists. But some of the weapons used by the fighters or the, the, the terrorists comes from the government. So you see how come that they have those ammunitions and weapons. Meaning to say that someone was got corrupted. And we see the protracted insurgency in the Philippines. How come that for so many decades, we still have this problem on insurgency? Whereas our neighbors has ended it in 1970s, 80s. What is the formula for that? Another is our culture on Rido. Our culture, how come? I have Malaysian Indonesian students. They are Muslims. They are military officers. When we come to Mindanao, we question also, that's not a Muslim culture. That is a Mindanaoan culture then there must be something wrong with our culture because of the roles of the stakeholders on how to create our culture. So tendency-wise is even if like, then we translate it to Bangsamoro now, and then there's the substate on Bangsamoro. Even with the vision of perhaps transforming the region, it seems like the old guards and the same powerful people are in the same system and only the name was changed to Bangsamoro. Do you get what I'm trying to, to drive at here? That sometimes even if we have the best vision on policy making, if the system is corrupted, corrupted and the same people are there and same people who envision of something that is transformative, but they don't get out from that position and they will they are the same people who will be um, uh, implementing the same vision that they thought would transform something so you see the irony of everything there there's contrast no that's why it's so hard to to you know to to how to restart and there are some many there are different interventions you know what happened in china they had the the, the cultural revolution and the, by doing that, they have to purge everyone, kill, and then change the system. But we cannot do that in a civilized uh, 21st century Philippines. So you cannot just kill anyone. And we did that in our drug war. And it seems it didn't happen. They tried to kill. And they, they, they thought that by killing one another would resolve everything. And they realized that that's not the problem. It's the system itself. Because some of the police officers themselves are corrupted. And they should be implementing those uh, those 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 uh, policies supposedly. So you see the, the the discrepancy. You see the the problem of that. Even if you have great visions and good policy makers, when the system is corrupted, it's so hard how to start from scratch. The the question is a kind of philosophical in its essence that sometimes. We have good ideas. And I, I remember that was the question that I asked also last in my, in my, in my class uh, recently. And my students were like telling, sir, even if we have all the best ideas now, we cannot still answer it because the system is still corrupt. <laughs> so so that, that's the reality of uh, Philippine, uh, uh, Philippine uh, politics and Philippine uh, political system, basically. Of course, it's, not only, it's a problem because it's very political. I hope I, I was able to, to, to answer uh, your question, uh, Dr. Hurtado. Uh, it was an inquiry for, uh, oh yeah. Um, it, was an, it was a reaction and a question and in line with 
Mr. Dennis's inquiry. Right, right, right. So for the for uh for some added representation, and this will be the last one before we mm. proceed to the awarding of the certificate. Um for the hard sciences, mm. I remember that in 2008 and 2009, although this is a considerably classic issue since mm. when can we exactly trace the original instance that people were selling their organs mm. in order to resolve um, an economic concern of their mm. household, right? And mm. this is classic in the sense that we still have these issues recurring up to today. Mm. Sometimes in jest, which um, we see this happening in jokes, but it's pretty much a reflection of reality. Organ right. leggings, sir, mm. and biopiracy. Mm. Well, again, it's a question of um, there are two things no, uh, that I have in mind, no? uh, two different schools, schools of thought. Some would say that, uh, well, it's her body. It's a right to, to, to on how we use it. But definitely, do you think that a developed country, uh, 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 citizens of a developed country would be doing that? Definitely not. What is the context and the reason why they are doing that? Because they want to get rid from poverty or maybe because of the many uh, financial problems that they, they have. That's the reason why that's the only option that they got. And if we try to elevate that sociological issue on what is the role of the state, then definitely it's the failure of the state on how to address the basic needs of the, of the people, basically. And if we elevate it into higher perspective, it becomes a national security issue also because it's the personal security, which is the focus of human security. And it is a failure on how insecure we are as a state and as individuals because we lack the mechanisms and interventions on how to address this properly. Now, definitely, um, the second option there is if the state is at least in a better position to give what is due to its citizens, then basically these things will not happen. And I think that the state has a bigger role, even if we are now talking about human security now, the state will still have a bigger role on how to secure its people because that is mandated by law and that is how a state should work on how to secure its people and its society. Then if it doesn't uh, do its part, then how can we expect from our institutions? Generally, it also revolves to the strength of our institutions because if we have strong institutions that will address the needs of its people, then basically that state through its institutions have succeeded. But it seems like the continuous um, problem on this um, health security issue is a manifestation that we have a weak state with weak institution. So how do we resolve that? Definitely, by strengthening institutions, you have to invest on people. Invest by giving them good quality education and by giving them employment so that they won't go abroad and they would invest rather their talents in our own country and restructure some of the flaws in our health policies and health establishments. That's why you should have a universal health system so that regardless of the socioeconomic status of people, at least they have some other good options on how to resolve these financial issues other than selling their organs. So you see the meta structure of all this basic problem on selling organs. Although there are different schools of thought on how to resolve it, but basically what I'm trying to drive at here, it's still the state 
that has the responsibility to secure us. So basically, it's still a human security to achieve human security. So you see the instrumentalities and the nexus of human security to human security. And it all deals on how we see security, basically. So basically, that's my answer to that. Thank you very much, Paula. Dr. Cabalza. So thank you also to our audiences who have submitted their inquiries. We'll now be proceeding to the awarding of the Certificate of Appreciation. So Far Eastern University Institute of Arts and Sciences Certificate of Appreciation is awarded to Chester B. Cabalza, PhD, for his valuable contribution as a resource speaker for the topic interdisciplinarity of national security in celebration of Cybersecurity Awareness Month, given this 19th day of October, 2021 at Far Eastern University, Manila, signed Roman R. Sarmiento Jr. II, Department Chair, and Dr. Rowena Capulang Reyes, Dean of the Institute of Arts and Sciences. Maraming salamat po, Dr. Cabalza. Thank you very much. Maraming salamat din. We would love to hear from our audience. We have an evaluation form for this event accessible at the link provided in the comments section, as well as the official Facebook page of the Department of Interdisciplinary Studies. You'll be receiving a very lovely certificate of attendance as a token of appreciation for your input. So these are our official Facebook pages which are locatable through the following names, FEU-Department of Interdisciplinary Studies and FEU Interdisciplinary Studies Society. Now, interdisciplinarity is a trend that's here to stay. The Far Eastern University Department of Interdisciplinary Studies is offering three tracks, Philippine Art, Culture, and Society track, Global Development and Sustainability Studies track, and urban spaces and transitions track. Now, if you're interested to apply to transfer or if you know someone who might be interested, if, or if you've got questions, please do reach out through the designated Facebook page that we have. We would love to have you on board. Here at FEU Interdisciplinary Studies, we're bridging people and passions. Now for the concluding insights, we will be listening to Ms. Sheila May Julianda. Ms. Sheila. Good morning. Can you all hear me? Loud yes, clear, ma'am. Ayan. Yes, ma so good, good morning, everyone. Ayan. Before we end this session, let me express again my heartfelt gratitude to those who made this event possible. I would like to thank our IS Dean, Dr. Rowena Kapulong Reyes, and Associate Deans, Dr. John Anthony Yason and Mr. Mark Salvador Isla for their continuous trust and support with our department's ability to, de to deliver webinars that are relevant to our current situations. To all the faculty and staff of IDS, for the effort and perseverance to promote such wonderful naman karina, di ba? seminar that promotes responsible citizenship. So all the audience who allotted their time to listen, thank you so much, guys. And to our dear speaker today, Dr. Chester B. Cabalsa, for such meaningful and thorough discussion. We learned so many valuable things from your explanation and answers po, sir. Nag-enjoy po kami sobra. So thank you so much po. Indeed, that with the various conditions that the society are facing today, the take on national security is becoming an important issue that we need to address and improve. As we have learned from today's session, national security is not just to ensure no, the protection of our sovereignty, but from um, national security threats, but also to continuously defend our constitution, comply to our laws, and observe good and just governance in our country. National security is assuring that the well-being that the well-being of our citizens are protected, 
that there is freedom from fear, criminality, and exploitation from internal and external threats. If unlawful act such as terrorism exists, Filipinos can have the security that justice, no matter how hard and long it takes, will always prevail. Maniwala tayo, guys. For us to improve national security, we as citizens must change not only our behavior, but also our mindset. We must do our part to help our authorities to protect our peace and order. We must raise the bar. We need to raise our standard and our participation in preserving national security. And to do this, we need to recognize the need for and importance of including interdisciplinary approaches and perspectives, including interdisciplinary thinking from various disciplines such as psychology, sociology, anthropology, history, political science, human development, and economics allows us to see and discuss the problem from various angles. And in doing so, we can create tailor-fitted solutions. Adoption of the interdisciplinary thinking and sociological imagination helps us create interdisciplinary pathways of applying the knowledge and understanding we need to improve people's behavior. Changing people's behavior are crucial to the success of any nation. It should start from within. Kanina na explain na rin ni Sir yon. Um, as citizens, we are our country's hope and defender. More than the authorities, we also have to take part no, in preserving and protecting our country. The moment we choose to disobey the law, may it be big or small, we are becoming a threat not only to the lives of other people, but to the overall national security of our country. So as Filipinos, we must also do our part and obey the law. Let us all do our part to preserve and defend the security, not only from the external, but most of all from the internal threats. We must be strong internally before we can be strong externally. We are Filipinos. Let us not forget our history. Let us not forget the Filipino blood that we have. Let us not forget that we came from courageous country loving Filipinos that are ready to serve and die for the freedom of their country. Let's do our part as responsible citizens and let us all be brave para sa bayan. So again, thank you so much and have a nice day to all. Sana marami kayong natutunan sa araw na to. Salamat po. Thank you very much, Ms. Julianda. So just a quick plug for our upcoming webinar. We have Indigenous, the myths and fake news about the peoples in the Indigenous. This is scheduled for the 29th of October, so this year, 2021, from 1.30 to 4.30 p.m. So we hope you can catch that. Now, at this point, uh, we would like to take the opportunity for a camera diplomacy. Um, can we please request everyone to switch on their cameras for the taking of the group photo? And um, whoever's taking the photo, can you please let us know when we can blink? <laughs> Thank you, Paul. One, two, three. One more. Iba ayo mo magbukas ng camera. One more for for their national security now <laughs> and privacy. One, two, three. Thank you. Thank you very much as well. Um, we would also like to ask Dr. Gabalza if he can please stay behind for a few moments after we conclude our program. And so our program ends on this note. Once again, I'm Dominique Gentado, and this has been the Interdisciplinarity of National Security with Dr. Chester Cabalza, reminding everyone to stay safe and be brave. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Cabalza. Thank you, Idea. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Oliver. Uh, thanks for the... Uh... Uh, reaction uh, earlier. You're welcome, sir. 
And thank you, of course, to the chair, uh, Sir uh, Oman. Uh, thank you for inviting me. And of course, to Dr. Uh, Dominic. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, you, sir. For I, I, such right, right. Wonderful yeah. and interactive. Uh, yeah, yeah. With... I love, I love